Welcome to Modern Musings, Conversations with the Maiden, Mother, and Crone, where we look at ourselves and the world through the lens of the 21st century. Welcome back. My name is Amber Garvin, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Cindy Murray and Kristen Hessler. Hey, guys. Hello. And uh, if you didn't know, it's National Reading Month, and we are here with our second installment of Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth. And I'm pretty excited, guys, because we will be discussing chapters three and four of A New Earth. And hopefully, listeners, you guys have also read chapter three and four and can continue the conversation with us later. I'm excited, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if you haven't read it, you can still listen in, and it might uh, entice you to pick that book up and check it out. Yeah. We had a great discussion on it last month. Yes. And, uh, in fact, it was such a long discussion that we ran over and had an extra hour of bonus podcast um, because we wanted to continue the conversation. So I'm kind of anticipating that this one's going to be a long one, too. Yeah, so if you um, are just now tuning in, and you haven't listened to our discussion on chapters one and two, then I would pause this and go listen to that first because you're probably not going to know what's going on, right? Or you can just jump I in. It, it, I think some of the themes are the same. Yeah. Um, and luckily yeah. it's concepts. It's not a story. Um, it's more yeah. like a philosophy. So yes. you're... Um, not necessarily going to miss out on what happened in chapter one, who said what to who, you know, there's nothing like that going on. So if you haven't, haven't, uh, any clue about what this is about, you know, we can still dive in and, um, the concepts are universal. And I think that's the whole point of the book is that it's very universal. It's for mankind. I agree. I agree. And you can take or leave as much of it as you want. That's kind of one of the things that I picked up on this book when I first started reading it, um, not as much of it was absorbed by me at first. Um, and it's actually going back in the second reading. Cause this is, this is, as I'll remind you, a second reading for me, I read it last summer. And so some of it sunk in and some of it didn't. And, um, there are some things obviously that I don't agree with in the book too, but a lot more of it makes sense sometimes when you read more of the book, then you kind of go back and you're like, oh, that's what he meant. So, um, but again, you can take or leave as much of it as you like. I just like the idea of talking about some of the concepts. And so I think Amber has a place she wanted to start with. Uh, yeah, well, um, since we're talking about chapter three and four, I just wanted to kind of start with the beginning of chapter three when Toll starts it out. And, of course, if uh, you haven't read it, the title of Chapter 3 is called The Core of the Ego. And he starts it out by pointing out that most people identify completely with the voice in their head that they could be described as being entirely possessed by their mind. And that was very profound to me because I often get lost in my thoughts. Oh, yeah. Me too. Especially driving. I get kind of stuck like a broken record sometimes where I keep thinking about oh, yeah. the over same. Over and over, yeah. Oh, yeah. Scenario yeah. Over, over and, and over, over again, yeah. yeah. Well, and sometimes those narratives aren't that great either. And um, that's something he talks about too. And when you're in that in that mind, you're – it's like you can't tell the difference between your opinions and your viewpoints and facts. Does that make sense? Yes, and mm-hmm. uh, Tolle calls it the egoic mind, I believe. Yes, the egoic yeah. mind, and because uh, everything's based on the ego. Yeah, it's not really you; it's the ego. Right, and that's where he's talking about truth in chapter three being relative or absolute, because your truth is not the same as someone else's truth. So there really is three truths if you're talking about two different people's experience there's your truth your their truth, truth, their truth and then and then whatever's in between the combined yeah. yeah yeah and that's that's a common um saying or or whatever and but i th- i think um a lot of the stuff he talks about on the ego uh and he covers some of this in chapter one and two but um 
I, what one of the things that I got from this chapter when he was talking about the ego was that you can distinguish what the ego is and and the ego is not you the voice in your head that says blah 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 that is not you you are actually the being that hears that voice in your head and i think that was something he mentioned in the previous chapter um and but the ego is all about identification. It wants to identify with things. So it is looking for a validation of itself. Yes. And and it's it likes to separate. It likes separation. So it identifies itself as separate from you, different from you, um, or the same as you sometimes also. But it, it's always labeling things. The ego labels things. There has to mm. be an identification that goes with it. And But the ego is really just a conditioned mind pattern. It's conditioned by our past, by our belief systems, um, our experiences. Yes, and... Uh, Tolle talks about the ego as like um, every time you complain and resent something, that is your ego getting stronger. And I completely agree with that. Oh, yes, yes. He he talks about um, that when you're complaining, it gives you like a false sense of, of superiority. Because if you're complaining, then something has Isn't done. You're better than right. something yes. else. You or don't better deserve than somebody this. Else. Yes. Right. Yeah. He, he does mention that when he's talking about peace and drama. And he's talking about nobody wants um, drama. Or no one doesn't want peace, right? Um, the last sentence of that little paragraph, he says, Can you feel there is something in you that would rather be right than at peace? Yes, yeah. And and that's and that's part of that thing that complaining, um, and and when you are complaining by implication, you are saying that you are right, and the other person or that situation is wrong, and you know yeah. how many times have do we, it just offhand without even thinking about it, complain about something. Oh, the oh stupid every door is stuck, moment or, of every day. Well, I yeah. wouldn't say every moment of every day, but you know, right. you uh, wake up and. Uh, you take a sip of coffee and then spill it down your shirt. And you're going to complain about it. You, or you get out of bed that and the trip. coffee is cold. Or yeah. right. Well, and I work in a call center, so I feel like I can relate to that in a different way. Like those things, tripping and spilling coffee. That's something that you did to yourself. Yeah. That you can only True. blame yourself for. You deal um, with people that complain. Or I deal with people that can be difficult. So when I get, say, for instance, someone on the phone and they don't have the information in front of them that I need in order to assist them, I could easily, like, roll my eyes and go, God, I wish I could just get another person that wasn't, like, completely lost in their life, can get their things together. You know, my life would be so much easier, but my whole point of my job is to help these people. So why yeah. am I complaining about it? But it almost makes me feel like validated that, you know, when I complain, I realize that like, oh, you know, every time I complain about one of these people, you know, that calls asking for help and they need assistance or guidance, like, why am I complaining? Like, I should be thankful that they need my assistance and don't job. have yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's your well, job. And it's so. like, wow, what is my ego doing? It's like wrecking my life. <laughs> well, and, and Tolly actually makes a distinction between complaining and informing. So right. it's, um, I think in his example, he talked about the soup, uh, the soup is mm -hmm. cold. By telling the waiter the soup is cold, you're not complaining, depending on how you say it. It's how yeah, you say yeah, it. It's, it's all really in how you say right. all in so the inflection It is and the okay voice. to tell the waiter that your soup is cold um, because you're noting a mistake or a deficiency so that it can be put right. But if you complain, how dare you give me cold soup, that is complaining. When you're implicating someone to blame for that being cold, then then that is the complaining part of it. And um and you and he says, you know, to to refrain from that informing uh or you know to or to refrain from complaining does not mean that you have to put up with bad behavior. If somebody is being rude, 
you don't have to put up with their rudeness, but you should complain about it, I guess, is the point. And he talk, he goes on to talk about with that, um, that when you see rudeness in other people, a lot of times that's actually something that's in you. And um, you notice the things in other people that, that you don't are actually want to notice in yourself that you don't want to notice in yourself. Yeah. And, and actually by acknowledging that it, that it's not personal, that person being rude is not a personal attack on you. It's just their ego reacting to a situation. Right. And once you realize that, then you can handle that situation a little differently and you cause yourself less suffering by meeting them on that level and and acknowledging that it's just it's their ego that's talking not the core of who they are right right and it's yeah. just a little tiny thing too like for me at work when someone calls and they don't have their identification card on their hand and they got to go dig through it like I can hear people digging through their purse or rustling around in their stack of papers um you know they didn't do that on purpose to make me angry right it's just it happens right it's life mm -hmm. and me hanging up and rolling my eyes oh, I'm glad that's over with isn't going to make that situation change. It's not going to help that person live their life better or or help you live your life better. Smooth even. my work process up any at all. All it does is it rolls on that attitude onto the next call because in 10 seconds later the phone rings again and I'm still rolling my eyes. That creeps into the way I treat other people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so then you're going to answer the phone and you're all annoyed and the next person on the line is going to be like, Undeservingly what, gets dude? my attitude. Yeah. And, and I totally like hate that. And that's that the ego. When, yeah. you know, say like a telemarketer, not even tell like a somebody calls and they're automatically annoyed because, and I, you know, I get that a lot from the call before. Yeah, so you can feel it. Yeah, yeah. you feel you can that vibe. Feel it through the phone. Feel the vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. And one of the things about the ego is that um, that he points out is that it can't tell the difference between an event and the ego's reaction to an event. So when you're thinking back to your past um, or something like that, or or even the present, if something happens, it's not the event. Or the, the rustling of the papers that's the bad thing or whatever. It's your reaction to it mm -hmm. is what... I made that become a thing. A thing, yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this reminds me of something we talked about before with the girl on the show where she remembered her dad. She was trying to yes. hug her dad. That was on uh, an episode of New Amsterdam that somebody pointed out to me about her memory being... Um, because your memory is fallible. Right. Her emotion, she attached her, her emotion emotions to that memory. To that memory yeah. And it distorted the memory. And um, in her, yeah, it, if I remember correctly, she had this perceived memory. That her dad was pushing her, her away. Her dad pushed her away. But it really wasn't that her dad pushed her away. It was that her mother was pulling her away. But she had distorted all that with her emotions about the event. And so it's, Sometimes our reaction to the things that are going on is what gives us the grief or the suffering, as as Tully puts it. Um, we create our own suffering by reacting to those things the way that we do. And um, so that's, that's one of the things that he talks about um, when he talks about creating the new earth. He talks about how we should, um, we need to become aware of ourselves and aware of our egos and that at some point we will all, if we can evolve or, or that he doesn't use those words. Those are my words. Um, when we all awaken, then we will create a new earth because we will no longer be sucked into this ego thing anymore. But, um, 
in order to create that new earth, we kind of have to lessen or dissolve or eliminate the ego. And he kind of talks about this, um, the way he writes the book, he kind of weaves in and out of different concepts and he um, comes back to things and he touches on something and then he goes on to something else and then he comes back and touches on that again. And that's one of the things he talks about is the ego and lessening of the ego and becoming awakened or aware of the ego. And, and he says that all that's required is to be aware of it. When you first um, notice that you're doing something and you think to yourself, that was my ego, then you are aware of it. And then you are no longer in your ego because you are aware of the ego. And one of the ego's functions is to basically make you think that it is you because the ego's purpose is just to keep itself in power and to strengthen itself. Yeah, like you're right and they are wrong in any argument. Um, the ego will try to convince you that you are right and the other person is wrong and it really doesn't matter what the argument is because the ego is always right. Yeah, that's According true. To it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And um you know, when he talks about an argument, he's not just talking about, you know, I had gotten a fight with my husband or or whatever. He's talking about um any time that you are at a differing opinion with another person you are in an argument basically and what happens is that you tend to um kind of stand your ground it's like you you become all involved with the ego and you can't let go of the the need to be right and and sometimes people will defend that need to be right to the point where they resort to violence and and things like that, and it's you know look at the world today like um so so many fights over so many different things that could be resolved in another way. I mean, especially with young people like when I was younger, my mom used to say let me go get a fence post and put it in front of you because you would just argue with a fence post because you think you're right. And I get that now, you know, being an educator and uh, how many times I want to say, well, let me just go get a fence post and put it up here if you're going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> so so he touches on um, conflict and um group conflict and things like that in, in both chapters. And in my notes, I kind of combined them all into one. So I'm not really moving from chapter to chapter in the discussion, but he talks about, um, a lot of times, um, like when you're talking about the complaining, complaining becomes resentment, resentment becomes a grievance and a strong grievance can contaminate large areas of your life. And, um, and then what happens is, um, groups of people will come together with the same grievance, um, a, a, you know, a nation, a political party, a corporation, a sect, a club, whatever. And, uh, that becomes a collective ego and collective egos need conflict. They have to have an enemy in order to have a purpose. Um, the ego without an enemy has no purpose really it, because the purpose of the ego is to identify and to separate itself from other beings. It is ego is identity. And when, you know, if you are making an identity, then you are forming or strengthening the ego. And he, he talks about collective grievances that survive for centuries um, and fuel violence all over the world. And these things, I mean, we see it all the time in the Middle East. Those those conflicts have been going on century after century after century to the point where these people um, 
have a us and them kind of attitude. And, you know, the, the greater part of violence that humans have inflicted on each other is not the work of criminals or the mentally deranged, but normal, respectable citizens serving the collective ego. Mm-hmm. And, and he says that. Um, and when we label groups, that's who he is, that's who they are, that's who we are um, in that way, we're confusing the ego that we perceive in those people with their identity, and it makes us superior again. And so that that's kind of where war starts, where we believe that we are superior um, because of that collective ego. And, you know, our we have to make it our mission to eradicate that evil. Or, um, you know, if you don't break out of that egoic mindset, then you actually become that very thing that you're fighting against. Mm. And so, and he says, whatever you fight, you strengthen. Whatever you resist will persist. Yeah, and then you really don't see who's right and who's wrong. The line just kind of, it just it, blurs it between blurs. conflicts. So then... You're, you're just, you just wonder like, well, why am I here fighting again? Yeah. It's right. Just argument for the it's sake of argument. A, it really yeah. is. Time. Yeah. And he talks about the, how the collective ego is often worse than the individuals who are part of it. Um, because groups are capable of atrocities. I mean, think Nazi Germany. Um, People. Yeah. That, mentality, that an individual person mentality. would never do. Right. Right. An individual person would never just do the things that they did. Think about um, the, what do they call that? Um, protest, peaceful protesting. Imagine, uh, you know, what happened in uh, January of last year when there was the protesting at uh, you and know, in Washington, D.C. And it became a, unpeaceful because it just takes a little bit more anger and a little bit more of that, that mob that mentality collective ego just set things on fire. It's forward. like, Hey, yes. One little match burns the whole thing. Yes. And, um, and the other end of that is that a lot of people sometimes wake up and realize this collective that I've identified with is actually insane. Um, you know, because you get that, that, far end of it that where it's just people are acting at the furthest end of the spectrum and you're like I don't want to be a part of that anymore and and then people tend to swing the other way and identify with the far opposite end of it and so it's kind of this swinging back and forth and you just adopt another belief system rather than stopping yourself and saying wait a minute why am I trying to identify with anything? This this is all not, none of this is who I am. Right. Right. Well, that was uh, one of the things, too, um, that he talked about was um, trying to label yourself that you will never get peace if you're constantly trying to identify who you are mm. by trying to like put words onto who you are and like what you stand for and who you are mm. like it's, I, I could talk you're like at more peace yeah you have that. more peace and it was actually kind of interesting because now that i'm married you know and a mom suddenly um you know my life changed a lot all at once really fast and um it was really interesting because I remembered sitting and talking to mom, you know, maybe like six months ago because I was kind of feeling stressed and overwhelmed. And I turned and looked at her and I was like, I don't even know who I am anymore. And I think I spent probably six months like stressing out about trying to re-identify myself. What a waste of time. Like, right. I feel like I'm still the same person that I was. I didn't need. And he talks oh, about that, about myself. finding peace yeah. with that. Um and, and I think I've talked about it, too, about how I spent all of um, the last couple of years trying to get clarity about who I was and what my purpose was and, uh, you know, to re-identify myself and, 
figure out who I was and why I was here. And I think we've all definitely gone well, through that at least well and once in our life. You well, know. and COVID I think has has affected that as well. And because it's changed so much for so many of us, mm -hmm. like for me, um, until two years ago, I would, if I asked who I was, um, a lot of times the first answer was I'm a travel agent. Um, I'm a travel agent. I'm a mom. I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden that didn't exist anymore. Um, COVID killed my career basically, uh, you know. <laughs> I, and, and in retrospect, that, and along with what Tolly says, that's not who I am. That was something I did, but yeah. it's not who I am. And when he's talking about it, uh, I think it was in chapter two that you have to be okay not knowing who you are. Once you are okay with not knowing who you are, then you can just be. be. Right. Your authentic self, because you can't be your authentic self if you are always trying to label, put a pin on it, you know, right. because that pin ties you down to that label. Right. And that brings that back to the relationships that he was talking about Two people. Um, you get in a relationship with someone and you have your idea of who they are. And yes. who they are for you. Yes. And so, you know, Amber you and I, you know, we've that, both yeah. lived with this, you know, or when you two, you've been married, um, you know, and divorced. Yep. So you understand, um, you know, you get into a relationship with someone, you have this mental construct of who they are and what mm -hmm. they're supposed to provide to you, what your expectations mm -hmm. are. And then as you move in with someone, um, you know, it's easier when you're on a date to have this like cookie cutter form of what you want to present to that person. So once you've established that relationship and you move in with that person, um, the cookie cutter, cookie cutter walls start to kind of fall down and that person um, may not be able to live up to those expectations that you set in your mind because that's not who they are. And then you start um, seeing behaviors uh, that don't fit those expectations right. that you have. And that's when things become difficult in a relationship because they may um, not say thank you every time that you give them something or come right to you whenever they come in the front door. And those little things start to nag at your ego because they are not doing what your ego needs them to do. Well, and we've talked mm. about that before too on, uh, maybe it was the Galentine's episode where we talked about, um, the love languages and mm -hmm. stuff and the things that you need from that is different from the way maybe that they show and the things that they need may be different from the way that you show. And, um, and those are all labels and, when you step back from the labels and just see them for who they really are and accept who they really are, then that, um, then that's two actual people that, um, how does he put it? The, the being two beings without the human part of us that are connecting. Mm -hmm. And that is real love. When you accept someone as they are without all those constructs right. and all Isn't those that explain like unconditional love. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Loving someone without their condition of feeding. Your right. Ego. And he, he talks right. about it in the, in the aspect of um, parenting about just enjoying the pure essence of being with the child, um, for not, not doing anything, just experiencing them for who they are. Um, but then he points out that that it really applies to all relationships and, um, yeah. One of the things that he mentioned, uh, I don't remember the exact quoting that I highlighted, but he was talking about two people having a conversation. You have the being like you're talking about mm -hmm. two beings and their egos. Yeah, so you it's think about two people having a conversation. It's really four, four people. people because it's your ego 
and your true self having a conversation with, with someone. somebody and their ego. Yes. yes. And like your reality when you're disgruntled because your significant other comes in the door and greets the dog instead of you first. That's <laughs> your ego. Your spouse isn't doing that on purpose. It's not malicious. Right. That's your perception, and that's your ego your telling ego. you a story. You number one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so that's your ego sitting in the corner of the room saying, look at that. Can you believe that happened? Mm -hmm. And that's how the ego makes itself important. And, and really, the ego creates the suffering in your life. And, and he talks about that quite a bit, about how suffering is something that we create for ourselves. Um, if you just let go of the complaints and the normal annoyances that you have every day, like say if somebody cuts you off in traffic and you immediately get mad and then you want to tailgate them or something like mm -hmm. that, if you just let that go and just kept on driving, then you would make it to work your normal pleasant self you wouldn't make it to work yeah angry. you you are the one who it's your reaction to that yeah. situation that causes you the suffering it's not the action of that person cutting you off in traffic that causes you to yeah, suffer it's like they're it's not your yeah. reaction to it right so when you saying. get mad that is what creates the suffering in your life that's why the suffering is the illusion right yeah and, and such a waste of energy, such a waste oh, it of an emotion. Totally is getting mad about every little thing that happens. I mean, just go with it, right? Go and with it, the flow. It actually, he talks about it being it's it's kind of a victim mentality because you're what you're doing is saying that you did that to me. It's to yeah. me. It's you to cut me. me off. And yeah. and yeah, and the ego likes to hold on to those things because. And it, and it likes to share those things with other people. It likes to complain and, and let people know that it's a victim because then other people give it sympathy or pity. Validation. I, I, they validate yeah, it by being interested in your problem. need to be validated. Right. Like um, that person that complains the most or they just, um, you know, call another person just to talk mess, you know. Yes, and, uh, yes. They need that validation, the sympathy, the, oh, right. I'm sorry. That's because why that I don't like talking about other people in negative ways because it's easy yeah. to fall into that trap. It of, is. It is really easy. That and negative I'm, gossip. Yeah, I will say really I'm trying really, to get it out of I'm, you. I'm bad about it, too. I And I let myself fall into those patterns. And I'm I'm working to not do that anymore. And But it's it is really hard. It's hard not to complain. It's hard not to be offended. Mm -hmm. It's hard not to be outraged. And, but, but really, and you know, we tell ourselves, I shouldn't have to do this. I shouldn't have to suffer. Why is this happening to me? And, and it's, 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 um, what, what makes you think that you shouldn't have to suffer? What makes you any better than anybody else? And, Really, Tully says that suffering has a purpose, and that's to evolve the consciousness and burn up the ego. And the thought that you shouldn't have to suffer actually makes you suffer even more. Yeah, because uh, life, you're suffering about suffering. You life are. is what you make it, and I've all. That's one of the things that I tell my students is like how you are. It's what you make it. It's the energy that you put in it. If um, you wake up and you just are determined to have a bad day, then you're going to have a bad day. It's and it's also with your body, scientifically with your body. Like uh, if you get in a bad mood and you start having headaches, you made yourself have those headaches. I Absolutely. mean, I know there are other factors because I have chronic migraines. So if the weather changes, I have a headache. But if I get a headache from stress, it's because I made myself have it. Right. And and he says, you know, a lot of times if if you perceive other people as the main source of the problems in your life, it's very likely that you are the problem in your life. Well, and, definitely. And that you, you are, are the you one. <laughs> and if you think that everybody else is causing these problems in your life, you're probably causing 
your own problems. Problems right? for them. Yeah. Or the app. And, but you can't see it because everybody's always doing this or that to you. It's it's always their fault. It's a, and and I'll I'll will be the first to say I'm I'm bad about that too because um, a, a perfect instance is my husband comes in while I'm uh, writing a blog post and I'm right in the middle of something and he steps behind me and he starts talking to me and I'm like mad because he made me he made me lose see, your I train of, yeah he he, made, he you. made me lose my train of thought and and it's like. But he he didn't make me lose my train of thought. It just happened. It just happened. And to be mad at him is not helpful. To um, blame him is not helpful. And, you know, just pick up and when move it can, on. It can cause an unhealthy relationship, too. You know, when you're talking about, you know, like special relationships your close circle when you often every time they want to approach you you're like oh you distracted me or you made me forget what i was doing then you become um a negative um source for them so then they yeah. don't want to connect with you as want, often yeah. because they don't want to rub you the wrong way right you know yeah, and I then can't. it starts and then, and then it they creates its own like they say this thing well like i don't ever know when i can come talk to you because every time i come talk to you i'm interrupting you and and my husband has actually said those words to me before and i'm like you know yeah okay i i get your point you know but it, it's hard and and we've been raised in a culture of we feel like it's a blame culture. It really is. There's always a, and there always are always reasons for things to happen. And, and I think that's the, the difference is that we have to learn that there are actions and reactions. There are chains, there's cause and effect, but blame is a separate thing. So, um, and that's, that's a really fine line of distinction and you can't, just sit and blame other people for whatever it is. It it may be a cause and effect, mm -hmm. but you can't have that emotional attachment to it. I think that's where Tolly is getting into the point where he quoted Jesus and he was talking about forgiveness. Right. So forgiveness is accepting that that thing happened and not um, you did this to me. I mean, yeah, there are sometimes when someone like maliciously does something to you. Um, you know, like people who are victims of rape and stuff like that, like that's really hard to forgive. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's a lot easier to forgive someone who cuts you off in traffic. Um, it's easier to not blame them and just forgive and because you're accepting that it just happens. It could have been anyone. They didn't do it on purpose. It is just what it their is. Ego. It happened. Their it ego did an action. Injure and me. In any way, it didn't keep me from getting to my destination. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It's just some type of change mm -hmm. from what my perception of what was supposed to happen. Right. And that's my ego. Because you wake up and you imagine that you're going to get from point A to point B smoothly. And then when it doesn't happen, that's when your ego goes, oh, you know, mm -hmm. all these people ruining my day. Right. And, and, and unhappiness... Um, you know, it, it, those, those things are, are negatives and they, when you are always saying this is ruining my day or I'm, un, you know, I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy, those are negative things and those negative things just feed each other. And, and a lot of times in our culture, we feel like those negative emotions are justified. I'm justified. I should be angry at him because he cut me off in traffic and made me miss the light. And then I was late to work. Um, Get up earlier. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but they, but that's the thing. Yeah, that's is your that, ego trying to put blame on someone else because the ego is not going to accept that 
if I had woken up earlier and did what I had told myself I was supposed to do, I wouldn't have been late. Therefore, I wouldn't have been upset that the guy had cut me off. Right, right. Wink, wink. Right. And I, you know, and I've been trying to do that with my driving, you know, because I used to get mad because people would poke and I missed the line and I've got to sit through one more line. She's a very impatient driver, y'all. I am very impatient. Um, I think all three of us are. Come on now. (laughs) She's the worst. (laughs) Remember that time you got car sick just the other day? Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to kiss the ground after Uh, I got (laughs) but you know I've been trying to just be more patient that extra five minutes is not gonna make or break my day it really isn't and um but but when you live in that negativity really there's some part of you your ego actually but there's a part of you that wants that negativity it needs that negativity and You need to ask yourself, what is it? What are you looking for? What do you think you will get Mm -hmm. out of that negativity? Are you looking for somebody's sympathy? Are you, um, does it make you superior? Why else would you make yourself miserable by being negative? Why? I, I think that some people just like it like they thrive on that drama like they go into the world into the day and they look for things to be offended by yeah to be offended by or to be dramatic they look to stir the pot and they want to make chaos in the world well and i think a lot of times those people are the very same people who say i don't want the drama I don't oh, want sure. the drama. No, no. The, no. That, those the thing are is, those same people. They are. Because. I don't it, like drama. But the thing is, is they, they don't want your drama. They want their drama. Yeah. They, they want the. They. Or, or I want my drama. I don't want your drama. I want my drama. Yeah. They're subconsciously stirring the pot to get attention and to get that drama. And Absolutely. To, and that's in the roles when he's sympathy, talking about get you're everything. a villain, a victim, or a lover. So when you talk about someone who likes to gossip, they are gossiping about villains, victims, and lovers. And they are probably thinking they're the lover. But I really feel like you might be a villain if you are... Oh, the people that wanting to gossip about other bring people. Bring up the gossip and then like yeah. stir the pot. Like, oh my God, they Amber, did you see what that lady was wearing yesterday at the meeting? She looked hideous. That yeah. is, that is not a lover. So I don't know if you guys watched the. It was a few months ago, like the recent Bachelorette. No, yeah, you know, there, there's I'm another there's another one on coming this. up, but like a. There was a guy on there that would deliberately go, and this this kind of affirms the fact that I always say guys like drama more than girls, <laughs> and and the Bachelorette proves it. There's a guy. There was a guy on there that would deliberately go and say things to other guys to get them upset mm. and try to get there, other guys kicked off. There's girls that do that too. Well, yeah, I oh, know. Yeah. I know. People do that in the workplace, too. Oh, oh yeah. My. Yeah. Uh, well, it doesn't matter where you work. He yeah. talks about the ego and work and, and that there are people who self-sabotage themselves because they are so absorbed with their ego. And and those are the people who um, maybe they withhold help or information mm-hmm. so that you will fail mm-hmm. um, because it makes them look better. Right. Um Oh, or sure. or they um, oh well, here talk about these uh, doing employee evaluations and you have someone maybe or or they just need to some coaching on something and so you bring them into the office to discuss uh, you know like their attendance or something and while they're being um, you know critiqued on their attendance they go well so and so didn't you see them you know use all the printer paper yesterday yeah and it's like it's somebody else under the bus to, yeah yeah. To, they know they're in trouble, but let me make someone else in trouble so that I don't feel as in trouble. Mm-hmm. And those those are people who are totally in their ego with work and stuff. And on the, con- conversely, he does talk about there are people who who are egoless in their work, um, and those are the people who often are really really good at what they do, and they just kind of get in that zone and they are one with what they're doing. Um, they're in the now. 
and they're one with the people or the tasks that they're serving and their work is almost like a spiritual practice. And, um, and, and those people that do that, you know, and, and you've seen those people, they're, uh, you know, nurses, doctors, musicians, um, builders, even, even people who are working in the call center, the people who oh, are yeah. I know exactly dedicated when you say that. to serving. And they make it look so easy. They make it look really easy and they're really there to serve your clients or, um, and they, and they are, they're just really in the zone. And those are the people who are creating the new earth. They are the people who are building the new earth. And then the, the other people, um, they're technically good at what they do, but they, they just sabotage themselves by, because they're only paying partial attention to what they're doing. Um, or they're trying, they're only there to get personal recognition or they're only there for the, the money. Um, and those people, they're just completely living in, in the ego and their quality of work is not as good as the people who are just in that in that zone and do it selflessly. And I think that's one of the things he's, he talks about. Um, and having read the book, I, I kind of get a peek ahead and he talks about this more later, but, um, the acceptance of doing tasks and, and he will get into that, but you know, if, if you go into every job with joy, with acceptance, then you are out of your ego and you are doing it. You're in the now. And I've tried to learn that too in the, in the moment of um, mopping the floor, stop complaining to myself that I've got to mop the floor again or wash the laundry or um, whatever it is that I have to do again and again and again, and just, enjoy the process of doing it. I know that's really hard to imagine, but well, <laughs> but, no, but just be there kind where of you are. Zen. It can be. Like it can be. And cleaning the, and organizing the can Buddhist, be zen. The Buddhists Sweeping do this. The they, this is a very simple concept in Buddhism um, where they totally just immerse themselves in the task at hand. And that simple task of um, you know, scrubbing the floor or whatever is a meditative spiritual act. And being there in that moment is a very enlightening. I, I don't know how else to, to phrase it. No, oh, I mean, I've completely done that before. And, and, and to stop complaining about it and, it's, it's hard to do. It's really hard not to be, um, it's, it's kind of like yeah. that with exercise. I know like, uh, we, we've been talking about, you know, 2022 and everything like that and new health and everything. And, um, I've been trying to go to the gym a few times a week, but like the hardest part once you start going, the hardest part is getting to the gym. Yeah, once you're and, there, yeah, it's a different story. Once you're there, it just becomes like, oh, I don't, you know, at first you're like, oh, I don't want to exercise. This is boring. But once you, like, get in the groove and you're walking or you're running or you're lifting weights and you're listening to music, and then next thing you know, an hour has gone by, and it is a very meditative experience and that's why some people love going to the gym because you do actually feel good about yourself when you leave mm -hmm. yeah yeah usually when i'm at the gym actually working out i'm like oh, i should do this more often i love this i'm enjoying this mm. even when it's hard and and difficult um it's kind of like that type two Type two, type two fun. fun that yeah. dad talks about. Yeah. Uh, my, my husband has a, a thing that he, he calls it type two fun. And it's, um, uh, I, I think this came from boy scouts or something, but it's like, um, things that are hard, but then once it's over, you feel this sense of accomplishment, like climbing a mountain or canoeing 20 miles down the river. It, at the time you're doing it, it may not be quite so fun because it's hard work. 
But then when it's over, it's like, wow, that was awesome. Let's go do it again. That was the yeah, time of my them. life. I yeah. Know. Yeah. And, and he calls that type too fun because it's not really fun, 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 fun in the moment, like going down the slide at the water park is yeah. or whatever. Accomplishment fun. It's accomplishment fun. And, and that's. Actually, There's water a... slides is type two fun for me because it's terrifying the whole time. And then I get down at the <laughs> yeah, bottom and I was like, wow, that was fun. Yeah. Well, that's, I don't yeah. go down them for that reason. It was reason. like that time we, the last time we went to the water park and I was kind of like, uh, I'm just going to stay down here. I don't want to climb all the way up there uh -huh. and go down this long they go down this short water slide while I have to climb, like, how many stories. Mm -hmm. But then, like, you know, once you get up there and lug the tube all the way up there, and then you get on it, it's like five seconds of fun. But you're just like, oh, that's invigorating. Let's go up all these yeah. ten stories again. The five seconds of fun. Yeah, yeah, five more yeah. seconds of it fun. It totally that, outweighs that totally the five minutes going up the <laughs> stairs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really or does. Or type, type two or type B, I I can't remember oh, whatever it is Talk whichever yeah. yeah 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 so yeah but um yeah i i don't know i think the the point of tolly is to whatever you're doing be in it be fully present in it and he he goes uh the second chapter is all about role playing the and fourth chapter the, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah i said the second running. chapter <laughs> we're yeah. doing chapter three and four Cindy? three and four yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think of it as the first chapter of the second chapter that i just oh, read the, yeah well so, yeah the first chapter uh, we're talking the yeah, second so, chapter we're talking about <laughs> um so but he one of the big things that big topics of that is parenting and um he talks about um being truly present when you're parenting and um present in the now and not just playing the role of parent. And I see this a lot where a lot of people just get so engrossed in the role of parent. They so identify themselves as a parent that when their child grows up and moves away or whatever, they are lost. They don't know who they are anymore. Back to that question, you know, got to have that identity, that ego wants a label. And but they, they've become totally wrapped up in that whole parenting thing. And, but they didn't, he talks about the difference between that role and actual being there in the moment with your child. And uh, Kristen, maybe you can remember um, part of this because we were talking, we actually talked about this a little bit earlier, but um I know I remember talking about it because I was thinking about it in terms of um, the the parents that become um, really overprotective and they interfere with the need of the child to explore and learn for themselves. They're controlling, they're overbearing um, because they're so wrapped up in that role. My child needs me and I need my child to continue to need right. me. Well, and there's yeah. also that whole concept of you raising your child and having these expectations of who they're going right. to be. Yes. And then you, you want them to fulfill um, all the dreams that you right. have. Um, I want you to do better than I did. I want you to have more than I had or whatever. And, um, it, when the child breaks out of that, then they criticize or they disapprove of their child or whatever. And, and they, they just, the whole idea of their concept of parenting is that the, the child completes them and they're, that's what they're trying to do. It's, um, yeah, that's feeding yeah. their ego because they didn't succeed at something or they have this set in their mind that their child is going to succeed so through they be them. They become yeah. somebody by making their child somebody. And the more expectations you have, the more you are in your mind instead of present. And um, and they talk. he talks about um, then when you see them make your child make a mistake, then... Um, that mistake is really only a mistake in your mind. That mistake. Yeah. yeah. Made... I loved that one. I highlighted that one. Eventually they will make mistakes and they will experience some form of suffering as all humans do. In fact, they may be mistakes only from your perspective. 
what to you is a mistake may be exactly what your children need to do or experience, which is right. exactly like um, what happened in my life. Like I've, you know, made some mistakes that were, you know, what some people would think like, wow, that was a really dumb mistake, Kristen. You know, you could have just not done that and, you know, moved on about your life and had a whole, you know, nice, lovely life. But, <laughs> you know, I had to experience, I had to take the path that said, don't go down that path because I had to understand what that path truly meant. Like, right, I guess right. I look back at that mm. and I learned things the really, really, really hard way sometimes just because, I don't know if it's because I'm stubborn or, or just that's how I experience life. Like my mom told me not to touch something because it was hot. And then I looked her square in the face and touched it because I needed to understand what she meant by hot, I guess, yeah. you know, uh, prove, I was proof her wrong. Way. I don't know. I was like four, but I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were older than that and still doing things oh, like that. And I so, did it like yeah. several times. I was told multiple times not to touch something because it was hot. And I have lots of little burn marks <laughs> on my hand. <laughs> still she, to did. This day. she would just remember. immediately reach out and touch it. And it's like, kid, did you not just hear me tell you it was hot? Yeah. But it was like, I'm, I have to test it for myself. I have to make that mistake. And, you know, some, some parents don't let their kids make mistakes. They don't let clean them up ex- after them. They clean up after them or yeah. they do things for them or, or whatever, or they try to protect them from harm, um, from hurt, from Do you think that's rejection. they're um, afraid of their child having a failure because then they might feel like they failed their child? Oh, Possibly. definitely. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. might that reflect on their parenting like skills. A, yeah. I and think so. I think a lot of parents nowadays are like that, that they don't want their child to fail. They just want to wrap their child in a bubble. I mean, it it's not like a, when I was a kid, you know, it was, you know, like my mom encouraged me to get out there, skin my knees, yes. uh, ride my bike, you know, that's, run into there's the mailbox a whole movement like about about kids all getting uh, what do they call those trophies um every participation, participation trophies. trophies so i'm a firm believer I, that us that grew ever. up in the 80s were you know we all didn't get a trophy right yeah right. we got and, first second and, and third we all place. got sad because we didn't win at something and so now we're raising but, our children and demanding that they get participation trophies because we are afraid they're gonna feel sad but the thing that's is our is that, ego that, that yeah thing it's about our the generation that's ruining the kids right. well <laughs> yeah and the, the thing is is that the kids who um got disappointed by loss they learned how to lose because in fact you cannot win your whole life your mother is not going to always be there to pick up after you and to keep you from skinning your knee and all that stuff so you you have to learn how to lose and by giving children participation ribbons or whatever you're not ever, they're not ever learning how to lose. And it also strengthens the parent because, well, now my kid's not a loser. So I'm not a loser. I don't have a loser child. I must be a great parent. Look at all of these trophies. And that's funny because I was in swimming in uh, high school and the summer city swim team, uh, there was always the big meet at the end where we all competed against each other. And I was always the slowest swimmer. Um, and I have this award for eighth place because <laughs> there was eight lanes and I got eighth place. And I look back at that award now and I don't have any pictures from that event. That's the only memory memorabilia that I have from that. And I think, wow, you know, I would much rather have a photograph of me in my swimsuit losing than this you know, vinyl award, whatever that yeah. fabric is, ribbon award, ribbon, silk ribbon, satin ribbon, uh-huh. whatever. satin yeah. ribbon that says that I lost. Yeah. You know, because really, I mean, eighth place, that was last place. It was the nicest way of them saying that I lost. I got a ribbon yeah. for yeah. losing. Thanks. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> I'd I, rather I have know. a picture of, I'd rather have a photograph yeah, or they... something to look back at that than. Yeah. But, than it, a but you know what? That was the, a lot of parents, though, and I will I will say this, I, I feel like 
I let you, even though you weren't the best swimmer, I let you stay in swimming. I mm-hmm. encouraged you to stay in oh, swimming. Oh, yeah, and you didn't fight with the coach because I wasn't winning. Like Right. Yeah. Um, and and I didn't I I didn't want you to feel like you had to win at everything. And and that's the thing. There's there's a lot of parents who, if their child can't be first, they take them out of it and go find something else. And right. and I think it's important to try a lot of things and not and not be good at those things, but still enjoy them anyway. I think that's also kind of like treating your child more like a peer and equal. That was something that Tolly talked about when you're raising your child. Is that they're not your product or your um, they're not less than you as a human being, right? And they're not yeah. your belonging. You don't own them. I mean. Well, I'd like to say that we do, but they are your responsibility, but you don't own them. They are their own person and they are your equal because it's only a matter of years and a little bit of experience that you have indifference. But at some point, they're the same age as you almost and they're no longer a child. You still, you know, treat them with equal and respect. And um, it made me think about something when he was talking about how you talk to the janitor versus the CEO. You go into these roles. Right. You talk to a child differently than you do a CEO. And it reminded me of how, um, you know, some person in my life might call me and say, hey, did you see the thing on the news? And they get really excited because it's something they want to tell me thinking that I don't know about it. Mm -hmm. And I'll go, yeah, I saw that already because I'm like. You know, yeah. yes, I did see that. You know, you're not yeah. going to call and tell me something I didn't know about, you know, trying right. to one up me on that, buddy. Uh-huh. But then if a child came up to me and said, hey, did you know the sky is blue? I'll be like, oh, it is. Yeah. Isn't that I mean, interesting how I, you know, have a reverse yeah. role on a child. Like I want to let them feel like they're telling me something and mm-hmm. I'm acting surprised. But when it comes to another adult, my ego steps in and goes, <laughs> yes, I did see that thing on the news. You're tell competitive. me about it. Your ego is competitive with those other adults, mm-hmm. but you don't it feel really competitive is. with the children. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's funny how... Uh, people's voices change when they talk to different people. Oh, yeah. Like uh, the tone of people's voices. Like uh, if you're talking to a child or a really old person, your voice is more high-pitched and animated. Softer. Or if you're talking to a male friend, maybe. Yeah. Your voice gets a little softer. Yeah, a little sexier. And you, <laughs> and you talk a little well, higher. Men do the same thing when they talk to other men, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They beef up their voice and talk a little or whatever, yeah, you and, know. And, so, uh, yeah. Women talk like a little cattier to each other, a little yeah, like, yeah. A, oh, you're not, uh, you're not going to one-up me, like you said. You know, women... Uh, d- are so competitive. Oh yeah, men are too. But you everybody know, it's is. just like can, every everybody. And I think right. that's uh, I think that's the whole point, point is, is that, that we all are. Our egos are competitive, and the whole point of the ego is to set itself apart and to set itself up above, superior to everything else, because it thinks it can't survive, which it can't, unless it is struggling to be better than more than whatever Mm -hmm. um but really the ego is a false construct it is nothing except for your reactions and uh to to past things in your life it is a mental construct formed of your past experience and once you break down that ego then you can truly be yourself and be who you really are inside. And that's the whole point of everything is to just be who you are. And not be who you are and not trip up on worrying about what other people think of you. Absolutely. Just be yourself. And if, those around you don't like you for um, being yourself, then that's on them. That's their ego. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You should be yeah. yourself no matter what. You should um, make yourself happy no matter what. Your happiness does not hinge on the people around you. And that is the whole point. Well, and, and Tolly says that 
the happiness, the secret of happiness is being at peace and being who you are. You, yourself, your being is one. Now, you can't look to other people for happiness. You have to look inside yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what a lot of people get hung up on is that they think that other people are going to make them happy, their approval, their attention. But no, you really need to make yourself happy or you're not going to be happy. That is true. And it, you know, it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. And um, like I said, he he's it, towards the end of the chapter. He starts talking about um, finding peace. The secret of happiness is finding peace, and peace being accepting who you really are, letting go of the ego. And and the only way you can find peace is to live in the present moment, live in the now. He calls yeah. it the now, um, being fully committed fully here where you are right now and that's where you get peace and then you are one with life you are one with yourself and he talks about um how we say my life this per this person messed up my life this messed up my life my life is off the rails but i'm ruined yeah your life is not a separate thing from you you are your life. So to use that term, my life is a mess or whatever, that's your... It's like you possess the life. It's not a separate thing. It really isn't a separate thing. And how can you, how can there be a life and you be a separate, a separate thing? And his, his final kind of thing on that is you don't have a life. You are life. Yes. You and life are one. And that's what makes you a conscious person. Yes. And I think that's a great place to leave this. Yes. Definitely. All right. Well, thanks for listening in. We are back next week with... Being Behind the Clock good luck Ooh. versus bad luck and oh, that, that kind of goes in with the now. that kind of ties in with this living in the now and uh the ego so we'll be back next week and we're going to talk a little bit more of that it's not Eckhart Tolle related but it kind of is but we're still going to touch on some concepts well, the, the luck of the Irish you know we all yeah. know that's not good luck right <laughs> no, no, it's not good luck. We're all Irish here. And it's uh, getting closer to St. Patrick's Day, so we need to uh, touch on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, big shout out to uh, Red Door Studios and Creative Audio Tech for our equipment and for our music services. And our listeners Oh, as and well. absolutely thank you to our listeners. Thank you for coming back week after yes. week after week. We love having you guys be part of our conversation Head over to our website. Um, the blog is there. You can comment on our blogs. Let us know what you think. Carry on the conversation. Like us on social media and join our Facebook group. Yes, our MMC Facebook chat. MMC chat. It, you can link to it right off of our Facebook page, which is Modern Musings MMC. So go to the go to the Facebook page, and then go to the chat from there. And we hope you'll join us next week. And continue this conversation. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.